For more information, feel free to contact us at pinnacleresults.com. So let's start the seminar. The first thing I'm going to do is thank Chris and, and uh, Project Execution for you um, to uh, put this together and give us an opportunity to chat this evening. As Chris mentioned, um, we have a lot to, to talk about and cover, and I'll be very comfortable with interruptions. If there's something that's going to take a lot of time to uh, go through, you may find answers on our website or drop me a line and I'll, I'll send it to you. I to Chris that we're at a point in our business where we, we pretty much just share stuff as much as we can. We've been in business almost two decades now. We can't get all the work in the world that we could get if we couldn't say do it. So we'll, we'll just move straight on with, uh, with our presentation today. Feel free for interruption. So, this is what we'll be going through. It looks like a lot, but it, it won't be too bad. The big thing is we'll be looking at right thinking, right decisions, and right actions. And what's happened over the years is that when you start hearing words like project management, project optimization, decision analysis, decision making, scheduling, cost analysis, all of this that gets thrown around in, in, in tool sets, we found that it would be useful if we could pull those together and get them into a rational methodology. So that's kind of the overview of where we'll be going. Um, this is one of Chris's slides, and I always <coughs> enjoy this, this uh, point. When folks give presentations and they say that in the ground rules, at the bottom of the ground rules, it normally says, have fun. So it's sort of incongruous when one says, by edict, you will have fun. <laughs> I kind of wonder about that. So, so we can assure you that we've got a project, and you do get the ore, the bread, water, and the leg iron from the whip, of course, and we'll keep flogging you until everything's lacking, because it's a ground rule that you have fun. We'll be talking about this. Uh, blue sheet methodology, where that came from. You might not know anything about it. You might not have seen it if you haven't had a chance to look at some of our stuff that we've published over the years. But essentially, it's using some of these tool sets to make sure that we're engaging, the team is engaging senior management well. Uh, why should you bother thinking about this stuff? Again, we had a conversation a couple of moments ago that um, recently an IADC, International Association of Drilling Contractors magazine, there was a one-page legal article and uh, quoted in it was the um, CEO of Rowan Industries, um, CEO of, uh, not Savvy, but one of their, their colleagues in, in uh, the oil and gas business in the Middle East, and CEO of Hughes. And they were all saying, okay, it's, it's, it's time to stop trying to save money laying people off. We just have to get better at what we're doing. We've got to drive 50 to 60 percent out of the cost. The capex, we have to get our OPEX down, we have to get our revenue off, and we have to make things that look difficult before doable in our, our new price environment. And when you think about it, if you go back to Somewhere it would be around about, I think, 83 or 84, perhaps. On one day, West Texas crude was $11 a barrel. $11 a barrel, WTI. <coughs> At that time, the company I was working for were producing in Egypt. They were producing $2 oil. Mm -hmm. And after that, a lot of the major companies um, started running their economics at somewhere around about $20 a barrel. And they were still running economics at $20 a barrel. And something, somewhere around about 9% um, discount rate for quite some time. So even though we're, we're looking at uh, 
a great upturn over the last few years and then pulling back to $40, $50 oil. We can, we can make Russia drive uh, at, at that point. So we need to use methodologies that actually work in our program. Um, so we're saying that even in these down markets, uh, if, if you can give teams the tools they need and a little bit of coaching, they can really perform very well. And now we're talking about the front end loading process. We're talking about what's sometimes called the stage gate process. We tend to try to be careful when it comes using the word stage gate. The actual hy uh, stage hyphen gate, not underscore or three dots or space, but the stage hyphen gate process was, um, or the, the term I should say, was um, copyrighted by a chap in Canada somewhere around about 20 years ago. I don't know if it's still valid. You know, at some point, uh, you, can't, you can't copyright chemistry, but you can copyright the words that you use to describe chemistry. So it's a state based approach, whatever one wants to call it. But if you have some improvement in that, that's a good thing. So this is, we're kicking it off today. We'll be talking about um, aligning the investments with corporate strategy. And what we have to be good at and nimble at is changing quickly from corporate side to changes. And being able to frame what you're looking for in a project and also being able to respond to that is pretty important that the team has that capability. The business and social priorities, it's not unusual for teams to have a tough time, uh, even though they've been working on the project for quite some time. We had one offshore project for a major operator here in town a few years ago. We had about 30 people and we were trying to take them through what are the, what are the real attributes of what we're trying to achieve here. And it took them 36 hours, two days of work to get to consensus on that. They've been working on it for quite some time. So there are different ways to engage multidisciplinary teams. How do you get your HSE people, your legal people, your administrative people, your environmental folks to be able to effectively talk to subsurface. If your subsurface people and production people are able to talk to your construction people and understand that you can't do an awful lot of construction design if you don't know what's going to come out of the well bore and you pretty much can't afford to, um, to design something that can handle anything coming out of the well bore for production over time. But things come to mind like would you do you put a sweetening plant in? Do you expect H2S? Do you expect CO2? Or do you just put space out there in case you need it later? Or do you trim down and make sure that you're not going to have space, but you've got a low capex to start with, capital expense, and uh, and hope. And then you start thinking about risk. What's the risk of those things happening? So all that is it's useful that those people can share those uh, those challenges together. Planning, getting the roles taken care of. We've, we've worked with some teams that once they had a rational plan in place developed by all the multidisciplinary group and they went to management, they were able to say, this is what it's going to take to deliver this project. They tend to be you know, projects with bees in them half a billion, billion dollar projects, and, and some 200 million dollar projects, a good sized project. And, uh, and then you look at what it's going to cost just to work this thing forward, and you can say to management, well, which part of this would you prefer we don't bother doing? And that opens up another conversation. Then there's a the value improving practice. You spend a little bit of time on that. I'd like to spend more time on it. We don't have a lot of time. But, and the reason I'm spending time on this, and I want to move pretty quickly through the rest, is so you know what's coming and you can target your questions appropriately. Somewhere around about 87, uh, a benchmarking group started measuring uh, results of operability in the first year. We started gathering data in 91. 
several of the benchmarking entities will suggest that you have to have a really good stage gate methodology in place first, and that may take a couple of three years. It takes a while to start from scratch if you have a major organization to get that culture changed and put the change in place. I would recommend you go to our website and download the change equation that says kind of neat when it comes to impacting change. So, and uh, feel free to drop me an email on anything I mention. I'll be happy just to send it to you or, or uh, my partner, Terry, will be in a couple of areas. So, um, and then they would suggest that then you think about value improving practices and squeeze another 20% out of your improvement in CapEx, OPEX, or return on investment. Our data shows the opposite. Our data shows that you can fund the cost of rolling out a complete methodology and stage gate of based investment methodology in a major corporation if you'll start by right doing value improving practices. You can save so much by focusing on constructability, technology selection, waste minimization, design capacity, and value engineering that you can get enough buzz on your cost and capability to fund all the rest. An interesting insight. That's what our data shows all on the Okay, here we go. This is the standard sort of stuff that, that you, you're familiar with. I apologize for the errant why over there, all of its own. <laughs> this has been seen by a lot of folks over the years. You're trying to reduce the risk at the same time as you're spending money, and then as you're spending that money, it's going to go up as you get to execute funding. But in some of these major projects, you're spending a lot of money just to get there. You look at offshore wells that are going to cost somewhere around about 180 million. And then you can't afford in a lot of those deep water plays, particularly, you can't afford to have a reservoir characterization like you would expect on land because it costs so much. So you're always making decisions in the face of uncertainty. So we'll talk about. A little bit about strategy and ideas, but mostly we'll be focusing on the front end loading, FEL 1, 2, and 3, as it's a common name. Give you a little background of what we've been calling the blue sheet. And a lot of our writings, when I say ours, the folks that work together with, uh, with clinical results, that's a safety moment, so. But um, the uh, Charles Jennings, um, Bruce Windsor, Mary and, and a few others have worked together to, to pull this, but it originally started with Charles and myself probably just over 20 years ago. And we started using blue because as we found out again tonight, my projector wasn't terribly bright and neither was Charles back then, and it was the best way to have something show up on, on the screen. So we called it blue sheet, uh, and then we just changed the background. So if you see stuff that said blue sheet, it's the same stuff, but that's very good. So this is what we're looking at, and we'll be spending time looking at each of those briefly. Um, are we running to somewhere around about 730, 745-ish? Yeah, so maybe. Yeah, so you have yeah, plenty of time, so you have at least another 40, 45 minutes. I guess as you had said, um, Chuck told me it was my job to talk at you tonight, but your job to listen, but it would be good if you let me know if you get through before me. <laughs> um, so we'll be looking at the right thinking, start a project, then the right decisions, and finally the right activities to think about. And putting all of this in the milieu of, of that phased investment process. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that we end up doing in, in, uh, in workshops, applying some of these tools. So you've got uh, the front end loading project delivery process, kind of consultant speak for stage gate methodologies. They all call it something else. MPMP is Marcos. Amicos used to be CAPM and then ACP and then BP is now. Uh, uh, CVP, the common value process, I guess Chevron is still using 
chip dip or something like that. They all have the names for, for their delivery process. But these things are nested in. So what, what happens is that um, we actually use these tools and we normally run teams with somewhere between 20 people working in three or four teams, or we run as much as 65 working in seven teams in a huge room, all at the same time working on different pieces of major project. That one was a Brazil ethanol project about 18 months ago. So they're working and they're using the state model of cities and having conversations about different pieces of the project. You'll learn about the objectives hierarchy which goes back some time ago to risk analysis and decision analysis modeling with a couple of folks that started off the same time as Dr. Howard did at Stanford. The objectives hierarchy traditionally uh, is just the top two lines of objectives and we've omitted that, Charles and I, with decisions and actions that give it a bit more robust, useful teams. Uh, decision matrices, we'll talk about a little bit. We've talked a little bit about risk capture and different ways of capturing that risk. Then looking at strategies. Strategies are investment themes, different words for that. Uh, <clears throat> and that's based upon the strategy, based upon the fact that you really don't take decisions on their own. You take decisions in groups, depending on what the overall strategy is. We'll explain that. So, now again, I'll throw this up to teams and I'll say, depending on the project, what is it that you just don't want to bother thinking about? Of course, if there's no EMP, maybe they're not worried about drilling. <laughs> but, depends on the side of the nature of it. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you can say, well, what are we just going to ignore? But the point is, there's a lot to this stuff. So well, let's look first at that overall thing. And you'll hear me talk about a decision support package, which again is another yes. We have that a workshop setting. Uh -huh. Is that is that like more of a training class, or are you working in individual project teams through the methodology, or are you carrying several different like each one of us is a different project manager, and you're walking us through that methodology? Or is it for a specific project? What does it say? Yeah, and it's, yes, yes, and sometimes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, we, when we can, the client will. We prefer to do training using a project, uh, and that takes a little bit of work beforehand because if we're doing the training, it's uh, it's quite usual for them to be able to identify significant savings, particularly if we're training in value improving practices software that we design. That's another. One. And would your audience in that training setting be a group of project managers? No, it would be the multidisciplinary team and project. So the whole project team? The whole project. Well, not necessarily the whole project team. It depends on what you're talking about. Because if you've got a session where you're only working on strategy, and this is something that it's done a little bit of a rabbit hole, but it takes some thinking about it, and that is sometimes um, with urging from uh, from stuff that's written in books and, and other books, you should have everybody involved in almost all things. But if you're talking about strategy, project strategy, there's probably some folks that are working in the refinery that don't have any background in strategy and aren't particularly interested in it. And you don't have to have them in that meeting just for inclusion, because you're keeping them away from their job. So it depends on, on, on that, but generally uh, for major projects goals, we will, can end up with, with 20 to 40 people, <coughs> four to six teams of 70 folks, working in different areas of the project, same project. For training, you could do project management if you wanted to train a whole bunch of project managers, it still would work best if you have a project to work on. Because when you bring in a project, and I've seen this done before, one of the companies that I, I work with, they designed their whole rollout for this stuff around a factory that was making mouse milk, and it was all kind of pie in the sky. And I've, I've been guilty of it myself from time to time, I'll talk about an emu farm. 
and is the Emu farm aligned with strategy and, and what are the ideas for it, what size should you make it and all of that stuff. But it's much better if you can do a real project for training. So, yeah, I have a question. So when, when, when you're doing these workshops, is it, is it post-contract signing or pre-contract signing? Because you said it's NDL, right? So that leads me to believe it will be um, pre-contract signing as you're doing know this. Well, it depends. Again, um, depends what, the, what we're pulling it together for. If you're talking about an EPC contract or an EPIC contract, EPCI contract or EPIC contract, where you're looking at installation as well, and what's happened with the project, because now again we'll get a call three, two thirds of the way through FDL3, and the sky has fallen, and it looks like what looked like a good project is two or three points below the corporate vertical rate, and they're about to walk away from it unless they can make significant improvements. And they're about to walk away from the contract. Um, then that's when you will want to do. do you yeah, 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 right. yeah. That's uh, that's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, doing something, but most of the time we'll be running this stuff before you're more than twenty percent in the fee. Okay. And sometimes, or, or many folks will go for. Uh, far enough along to do feed, contract feed, and then recontract um, front end engineering development. And then um, recontract the actual execution. Shell wrote a paper some years ago about how they believe they saved a lot of money by uh, contracting for design and build rather than bid design and bid build. Different strokes. It, it, it kind of it depends, and, and things change over over years. So on, uh, on the, I don't, I don't think there's a quick answer that it's always pre-contract award, but most of the time, yes. But that contract award would be the contract for building rather than a contract for the design. <coughs> Uh, it's not unusual to have a problem after the design and then to go back with the same contractor and have the same contractor in the room trying to improve a project, which can get a little sticky. But that's. Uh, we had one on, um, on a major offshore development a few years ago, and we had three teams of about 15 people each. And the project manager kicked it off with saying that if we couldn't improve the project by a certain sum, he wouldn't have a job, but he would be the last one out of the door. Hmm. And uh, he'd already promised um, the CEO that they were going to make a difference. <coughs> so that got some attention. And, but they, they were able to make quite a difference. Uh, I won't spend time on this, we'll come back to it later. But when you're looking at these decision support packages or investment support funding, again, that's pretty much got into describing something now as opposed to a copyrighted uh, approach. Most people know that it's a package you need to make a funding decision. <coughs> and this is what it looks like. You're looking at a multidisciplinary team using decision and value tools to develop a file in some sort of methodology. Okay, so. You know, it's all about creating value and not just churning out engineering because if, if you give me an engineering specification that's three inches thick, I probably won't be able to go down to uh, HEB and buy a couple of loaves of bread with that. They won't accept the checker. So it's about business. and. Uh, and sometimes that's a little fun for folks to look at. So you're really looking again at a competitive advantage, and we're challenged in doing that uh, this, uh, in this environment that we're in right now. So what you really want to do is have the teams very results focused, even if the results are changing, and be thinking very clearly so they don't have to rethink stuff, so they don't have to go back and redo it after that frustrates people and it burns an awful lot of daylight when they have to go back and redo stuff. 
and, and yet be comfortable and high performing teams. There's a lot of satisfaction for teams when they can say, hey, this is a better way of doing things, this is working out pretty good. And, um, and sometimes they'll find that using some of these methodologies, they can unfold for management uh, some options that have not been considered viable. So you're always managing yourself in the face of uncertainty. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any decisions. Decisions essentially may mean something is uncertain. So, you know, what's the what's the opportunity? What's the investment? What's the potential return? And how do you get that into some way to think about it and be able to make sure that you're making rational decisions? So, when you're thinking about potential, you're also thinking about options and risks. But you need to know what the hurdles are. What is it that someone will say no? I know that's interesting, but in the competition for funds, you're not making it. So you need to know these things before you start too far into the uh, into the projects. We'll come back a little bit on, on more of this. So this is a sort of summary of the sort of stuff that you would expect in one of these funding decisions to keep funding the project, to keep going forward in the project, particularly the major project, or a whole bunch of smaller projects. We did some work for a pipeline, and that particular year they, they had a budget of 220, 230 million, and they had about 400 projects. But they wanted to do some neat stuff in the portfolio to try to save about 20% of the whole portfolio. So there were opportunities there for what a drilling manager first got me into drilling with him for years ago, Chuck Allen called. Uh, establishing a bell cow in Scotland is like putting a white pheasant in with a pheasant claw. When you have the bell cow, you know where the bell is practically, so the rest of the cows are going to be there up on the hill. Or, or if you have a white pheasant up in the bracken, you can see the white pheasant, you can't see all the other flockers with it. So you can establish for a small portfolio and you can say, well, let's just rigorously hit this and see if we can get some things done that we can apply to all these other small projects. We used to do it. And the same thing can go on in, uh, in West Texas. And we talked about this at, at uh, I think it was the last one we had. We, we had, um, oh, what's the name escaped me? Um, on the um, completions. Air burdens. Air burdens. Yes. On completions options for, uh, for shale production. Try a bunch of different things. Maybe one will fail, but that's okay. Maybe this will cost a little more on this well. But if I can learn something that would save me 15% on the other 80 wells, that's probably good enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we'll start moving through this a little bit more smartly. So this is the sort of stuff you're thinking about in strategy. Strategy, you want to have clear, but realize it may change. So you know, when the market falls out of the market, there's a strategy change. So, when you're looking at, you have to be able to define the strategy and, and be able to, to share that and share changes quickly. And then the other thing, you can then make sure that the ideas that you good people are having are going to be, um, I, I know you're making notes, if you're making notes for questions, that's good, but Chris will have up on the PE for You website uh, this presentation with voiceover in it to fall, probably not before midnight tonight, but before to fall. <laughs> um, so we'll have that, and a lot of it's on our site too, if you want to download stuff there. If you're out in West Texas and your strategy in a particular well, or a particular field, is to um, get all you can out of the reservoir. Don't worry about reservoir optimization. When the wells get through, get the concrete poured to them, get your environmental stuff done and get off there. That's your strategy. You don't want your good people having ideas about infield drilling and reworking and, uh, and re-completions because they're burning daylight. Misaligned with strategy. It could be very interesting, but that's not strategy. So anyway, so they were on ideas. Assess or uh, a phrase or FEL1. The big thing about this is you're really looking here at can the project be viable? 
And there's a, there's a lot of folks at the industry that uh, are um, argue about this a little bit because they'll, they'll say, in a sense, you have to look at all the options to make sure it's viable. You really don't have to do that. You have to make sure that one's viable. The one's close enough to the hurdle rate to make it worth spending more money on in the choice space. Okay, so you want to very quickly get to a point where you think, yes, it is worth spending more money on. That's what front end loading is all about. If you can't do that reasonably quickly and there's other stuff in the portfolio, don't go to daylight, get off it, move on. And then the last part of before you're going to get funding is you have to have this. You have to know what the cost is going to be to choose the best way to do the development. Because you have to fund that. Remember again, all the way through this thread and everything we talk about tonight, at least phased or stage gate processes for projects, it's a funding decision to keep going. It's not a checking off boxes. Very also, when you get into, you're, you're going to generate, why did you choose something? And there'll be all the stuff that's in that decision support package. You're going to estimate what the, did, what the cost of going forward to the next stage is. And the end of the next stage is when you make that decision to execute the project, to absolutely finalize any, any left uh, P and IDs that, that have to be completed and get to cutting steel and build it. Okay. Because after you do that, the influence curve is, is gone. There's not very much influence at all. You know that you're going to build an FPSO, you're not going to build a, a platform. Okay. Design, full scale design. Finalize the cost estimate for the investment. All the stuff you do in that design finalizing. But it's still pretty rigorous because you still have that funding decision coming. So now you're looking at your building and you want to be sure that there's no surprises with commissioning and handover. That was a surprise recently for some who was in Trinidad. Uh, it was a, a, a contract that was going to handle the commissioning. They had a contract signed to handle the commissioning. Contractor was one of the major EPC contractors here in town, global contractor. They hadn't realized that in Trinidad, the operations group has to have a whole bunch of stuff in place, documented, before they will allow any hydrocarbons to go through a new system to be able to even start commissioning. <laughs> And that takes nine months to get that in place. And it wasn't on the schedule. So that was in the bit. Anyway, and then operating, make sure you've got the lessons <coughs> learned, make sure that things are being kicked back to other projects. Let me move on. So this stuff, when you look at it like this, it looks difficult and it is almost overwhelming, but it really isn't. It's just doing things correctly. And Charles and I both believe, and again, this is just maybe a little bit swimming against the stream intellectually as it might be, but you'll hear a lot, and you've heard a lot over the course of the last two or three years about projects that are complex and measuring complexity. And a few of the major organizations and professional bodies have, have got people working on and publishing on complexity and measuring complexity. A lot of stuff is not complex if you do the work, you know? It's just some of it's a lot of work, but if you do the right work, it's not that complex. If I tell you, Chris, I would like you to dig a trench. You say, I'm good at digging trenches, but I want you to dig the trench with this table fork. That's not complex, it's just hard. <laughs> but some stuff is just hard. Also, one of the things that happens is that when you start thinking about stages and gates, and we talked about this just before we, uh, before we, we kicked off, it's not unusual for companies to believe that 
If you implement a front-end loading or stages and gates methodology, great things will happen. They won't. Unless there are tool sets and different ways instituted and given to teams and they're trained in doing things differently and in a better fashion, what's most likely to happen is they'll do the same stuff they've always been doing and just fill out the pieces of paper that have different names on the top and nothing will really change. So you have to have good, robust, in many cases, new tool sets that you train folks in using to be high performing teams. Go ahead. So, good question. So I, I know <clears throat> I've seen a lot of organizations, <clears throat> especially when it comes to the stage paper process, uh, they'll have a, a list of tasks that they need to complete to go on to the next stage gate. And there are some organizations that are uh, really rigid in the fact that you can't go to the next stage gate unless all those boxes are checked off. And then you have um, some organizations that are very fluid in that um, you can only say, for example, if you have 10 items that need to be checked off and they only checked off six, but that six was good enough to, for them to go uh, on to the next gate. So asking a question to you, I know it kind of depends on the organization, but from your perspective, who's right or who's more right, I should say? Should, should you have an established, an established set of um, tasks that you need to check off before you go to the next uh, next stage gate? Or, do you, or should you just have a list of 10 and say, okay, maybe we're only gonna choose six of them? Yes, and that, um, using value improving practices is a good, uh, a good example of that. But uh, <clears throat> that takes you back to something we talked about a little while ago, we'll talk about some more. And that is, if it's a decision for funding, there has to be that conversation with the gatekeeper who will say yes, you can have the money, but they only need seven out of the ten, and they don't care which. Hmm. And then the further conversation is, well, why are we bothering at all if you don't care which? But you have to be able to have those conversations. So it's, it's not a case of being right or wrong. It's, it's more, why are we doing this? Like, you know, why are we burning daylight doing this if you don't care? If you don't have, but the, the other thing is that if you're going for funding from <clears throat> FEL2 to FEL3, you may require some more rigor in your decision support package than you require from FEL1 to FEL2. And certainly you may require more rigor to go from pre-FEL1 or ideas, say, hey, I think this idea might work. Overall, it looks like I can get the tone. I'd like to spend some money looking at it and assessing it, but it's not a lot of money. You may not need so much in the way of rigor there, but you have to have the conversation first. Because the last thing you want to do is go to a decision maker with a package that is not, as Dr. Howard at the Stanford is wanting to say, requisite. Meaning it's got what's required and no more. No less, but no more. And you have to know what that is. <coughs> Otherwise you stand a chance of going to a decision maker and the decision maker may say, that's a very nice potato, but I wanted the stone. <laughs> so, it's, you <coughs> have to get clarity. And the clarity also comes in risk analysis. Mm -hmm. If the decision maker will tell you, look at all the risks, make sure you've covered the spectrum of the risks. And if you bring me a matrix, a nine by nine matrix with colors green, yellow, and red on it, and most of the stuff is in green, that's probably enough for me to make a decision. That may be okay for the FEL1 and FEL2 decision. Some decision makers may say, that's all I ever need. There was a one, I have to be somewhat careful, but one company we worked with wanted to go ahead with a project the new project manager had just come from another major company. The other major company was very, very aligned with decision analysis, 
and cumulative probability curves of outcomes. When they brought the technology select uh, suggestion to this new project manager, he said, well, where are my curves? They didn't know that he wanted the curves, so I said that we could help, and we did a lot of late night stuff. But it would have been good if they'd had that conversation beforehand, that for me to make a decision, I need this level of, uh, of engagement. I, I think that, that it doesn't make the level wrong, it just means that the different decision makers will make the decision with different uh, levels of rigor given to them. I think if they have the big wooden desk and they're paid for doing that and they want to make an absolutely huge decision <coughs> and essentially that they're making it by which way the wind blows, one would hope that sooner or later that would catch up. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, you, you raise an interesting point. And I, I recall working with another organization where their stage gate process was uh, a little bit more fluid than, than I would have cared for. However, um, from, the, from, from my perspective, um, I would like to see if you're going to have, you can't go to the next gate until you quote unquote check all the boxes off. However, you make sure the boxes that you need to check off are exactly um, what's needed in the stage gate. So, say for example, you know, if you only needed to use that, that, 10, that 10 task activity again, so you had 10 tasks, but you only need to check six then have those other four either go into another um, stage gate cycle or either do away with them or, or do with other do do whatever I, I just don't like going to another stage gate without having everything in line because to your point if you let's say for example they, they checked off all those six that they need to check off but what about that seventh one that they didn't check well oh, yeah and that was the one that that, that caused them to have the um um, um what was that um, Catastrophe. Yeah, the catastrophe that was in, um, oh, I can't remember. That was happening in your end. You end up with 10 things and you can pick any one of them, uh, any five of them. You might say things like, well, we're not going to bother with that environmental or safety stuff. That's too much work. We just want And I don't think that's very wise. Mm -hmm. So at some point, that doesn't. I think there's, to me, there's, there's absolutely no goes. If you don't have this, you cannot proceed. <coughs> You're not, you know. So there's certain ones that they're, they're deal breakers. Now there's other ones. To me, it gets down to risk appetite. It's you don't have you don't have three of the ten deliverables you're supposed to buy. What is the risk of proceeding without those deliverables? And then what is the appetite of the organization, the executive, willing to take on? So in the beginning, a project you introduced. So we're off this stage gate stuff now. But we can come back to it and. That's a whole other function. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so this is the classic. Here's a, here's a classic project. Okay, you've seen this one before. Unfortunately, it's kind of close to true in many cases. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, how the customer explained it, the project leader understood it, the analyst designed it, the programmer wrote it, and so on. The business consultant, of course, described it. The, uh, the project was documented thus, and uh, operations installed, and then of course the, the bill, and it was supported, and what the customer really wanted. So moving right along, let's talk about the SIP model. Um, we started using this for the last two decades, and it's a it's an approach that works extremely well with teams. It's very interactive and it's simple. It's almost stunning in its simplicity. But it's amazing the conversations it brings out. So what you're looking at here are boundaries and external influences, and you're looking at what subsystem and what risk and interfaces and all that stuff. You're trying to get your arms around the whole project. So the state model is simply put together with blocks. Just Literally just blocks to understand it. Because if I put in there a, a picture of an FPSO floating production storage and offloading piece of equipment, 
And that kind of grounds you in there's going to be an MPSO, it's not going to be a turret mode offloading system, or it's not going to be a platform. So we don't do that. We're just saying there's something over there, there's some sort of goncus there that does something. What does it do? Okay, so what's the project about? And what are the ways you look at that? And you want to be able to have that discussion. So we know here that there's something going on subsurface, there's something on the bottom, there's something offshore, there's some producing offshore. There's something onshore, and, and, and then there's a market. And we'll probably have to think about it before we build it, we can actually sell it. You know. But for this particular project team, the onshore stuff, which could be a LNG regas plant in, uh, in China, and we could be talking about what do we have to do to, uh, to load up LNG in Indonesia. And all we're going is to the end of the, of the next train. And that's all, you know, we're not trying to solve world hunger or solve world peace. For this particular project, that's the end. Outside of that boundary, there's going to be people that can say, no, you can't do that. So what are the elements, what's the boundaries, and what are the interfaces? And once you start to have it, it tends to be a little bit more complex than this, but not much. And if you have four or five or six teams, and we each have one of those, and they start the conversation, and you take them to them through the conversation, then stickies appear. And stickies start to appear here. So they're a little bit more complex, but the same stuff, because some on building goes and some offshore stuff. This boundary, there's onshore facilities, NGL, LNG, the market, we're not concerned about that. But we may have to know what the draw is on it, what the capacity is. Different teams, they do it different ways. So, and here we're, we're looking at, so where's the boundary here? Where's the clarity? What is it we know that we're doing? These are just, these are actually real examples from projects that we've worked on. And this gets a little bit complex here. And one of the reasons it gets complex is you're looking at here, right on the boundary line are Town and country planning, state lands, fishing community, <coughs> the region, LNG train one. You're looking at all these people and authorities, the Civil Aviation Authority, all these people that can say no or yes or have to be interfaced with, and that takes work. And it has to be in the plan and it has to be funded. And it takes resources. And if you say to the project manager after having a conversation like this, well, what would you like us not to bother doing? And one of those agencies can say no, then it makes things difficult. And the same thing happens when you're working inside a refinery or inside a chemical plant. You're working inside the boundary limits, but there's a boundary inside of what you're doing in there. And they probably don't want you to shut the plant down to get the work done. <coughs> so, this is that just very fast blow over. You need more on, on how to do that and so on. We're happy to share all that with you. But this is what it looks like. This is one of the teams, and this particular one with Aussie and the racial Raka, they, um, they started cities up here. And this, this is one of six teams. And each of those was an interface or a risk or something that needed, needed to be modeled or a decision that still had to be made. Okay, so then you get into, this is the objectives hierarchy. The objectives hierarchy, I'm going to speed up here. This is classic decision analysis, the objectives hierarchy. Essentially what you do with the objectives hierarchy is you're trying to say, well, what's the length of corporate strategy? This is a classic objectives hierarchy where you're looking at what's the value criteria for the organization, what's the fundamental objectives, and what are the means objectives. Okay. And uh, the, we, this, the, the references on this, Clement, not the T, Clement was one of the, the authors of uh, in decision analysis theory, probably going back 45 years now, 40 years. So when you ask, 
What are the elements contributing to the value criteria for its fundamental objective and what contributes to those are means objectives. And you ask, why is this means objective important? Because it delivers the fundamental objective. And that was just the conversation that they said you should have way back then. So what Charles and I did was we said, well, this, this sounds interesting, but if we're going to make it work, and, and this is kind of the project value, you've got um, HSSE expectation, reputation, alignment with strategy, and alignment with the financial hurdle. And if you ask why are these important, they just are important. You'd be a fool if you didn't know they were important. <laughs> okay? They're just important. So that's the answer to those. But then you start looking at, all right, well, if those are fundamental, what is it we do that allows those to start existing? Well, we have to meet the standards. We have to meet the schedule. We have to optimize the capex as an objective. We have to optimize the opex, operating expense. We have to deliver reliability and operations flexibility, and we have to manage technical risk. And if we do that and achieve those objectives, that will be a good thing. It's a good conversation to have. And this is the classic, this is on a, a few websites uh, where you're looking at the primary, the fundamental, and the means. Well, that's good. But what really helps is what we added about 20 years ago or 18 years ago was decisions and investment. What decisions, if made well, are likely to have those means objectives happen? If we want to optimize something, what decisions do we have to make that would cause those to potentially happen? And to be able to make those decisions, what actions and data do we have to assemble to be able to do that? Okay? Let's do that. So we're looking at the fundamentals and then we're looking at means. That's the classic stuff. But what we added and we get a lot of utility out of, there's not too many people using it as they've been through this sort of conversation that we're having tonight. What are the decisions and what are the actions necessary to be able to make those decisions? Okay. Okay. This is what it looks like. This takes pre-work. You don't do this with a team in the room. This takes pre-work. You've got to get a small team together, get it done, socialize it, make sure people buy into it, and they come ready. Big thing about this sort of stuff is it takes work. But remember way back at the start, and I blew by it pretty quick because we're really not in the business of, of advertising or marketing. We did an analysis of what teams had documented they saved using these methods over the last 16, 17 years. What they said, not what we said. It's just over three billion dollars. <coughs> and that's just with us. Okay, so let's look at business priorities. I'll go fast on that. It came out of a book a long time ago by a chap. And initially it was a Renaissance man in value engineering called Carlos Fallon, F A L O N. He called it the Combinex method. And it came out of uh, value engineering methodologies uh, in pre-event work uh, initially. But you want to have a clear project vision, just answering some questions. What are we going to deliver? We're going to deliver this, we're going to do this, 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 and this. Why must we deliver it? What happens if we don't? And that's actually good for meetings too. If you're going to have a meeting, what happens if we just don't bother having the meeting? It's kind of nice to have that conversation. Okay. What well, are not open for discussion? What's said in stone? <coughs> We're not going to compromise the company's HSSE values. We're going to meet the regulatory and governing requirements. Set in stone. Okay? What are the overall team goals in this stage, this FDL stage? Then you get into the attributes of value or the key result areas. This is the stuff that really gets chewy and interesting. It's very difficult for people to agree on this stuff. You would say that's a quality car. It's a Ferrari, right? I, I have to look carefully because I've never owned a Ferrari or driven a Ferrari, but the horse tells me it's a Ferrari. So it's a quality car, right? But if what you want to do is move furniture over the weekend to San Antonio, 
It's not a quality car for you. What you need is an F-150, and it's okay if it's a used one. That's a quality car for your purposes. Okay. So, if you want to put a new plant in place, do you need a plant that can handle everything that you might think about bringing in? Or is it okay if it can just handle Alaskan crude? So it's important to know that quality itself doesn't mean anything. It's the attributes of quality for you, for your project, that means something. So if they say that old one, if I want a good, fast, cheap, I want a quality product, oh, it has to be quality, well, it doesn't mean anything. It's that those attributes that matter. Okay, just briefly here. Similarly, you can make decisions in design, contracting, procurement, technology, and constructability that impact that quality attribute. Okay? Now we're getting into attributes. Capital expense, schedule, cash out in the first year, premium, send out, secure, and that was for a weekend. Um, <laughs> You might think about project cost, capex, schedule to execute, footprint. Maybe you don't care about, uh, about uh, how well it does or how well it produces in the first year. Because you'd rather not live with the uh, with contract penalties because you weren't up and running. Okay? Maintainability, operability. Have you ever thought about the difference between maintainability, reliability, and availability? Can you rattle off what they are? Mm -hmm. They're different. They're all different, significantly different. FEL1, assess. You see stuff like this. What's the levels of roles? What are those? What's the alignment? What's the market confidence? What's the is funding available? Uh, what's competitive action? That's FEL1. You get into FEL2, you start looking at uh, emissions, you start looking at capex, capex flexibility, reliability offshore and onshore, much more project -y stuff that we're familiar with when we do engineering design. And then this is the tricky one. This is how good is it that you would never pay for better? And how and, and what's the bottom? What's the floor? You really don't like it, but you would live with it if you had to. And where are you today between those bookends? Because what that means is, once you start nailing those down, if you're delivering something that's more reliable, and you've got high capex, but it turns out that you've got such things as storage, in line capacity or line pack, maybe you don't have to be so reliable. Because if the plant is not so reliable, can it be down six hours every day? The plant can be down, but the client would never see it because you've got buffer storage. Then you don't have to pay for all that reliability. So you have to have these conversations. Okay. And you've got the current snapshot. Where are we today between the 1 in 10, this is what it looks like today. So this is meaning that if your capex short, and you really have to get your capex down to here, and you would rather pay much less because you don't have much in the budget, you would give up project schedule. You would actually not deliver on fourth quarter, you would go to second quarter the next year, and it would be okay, I don't like it, but I'll do it to save capex. So you have to have these conversations. Then you can pri prioritize what the team's pushing for. So they have to reach consensus on what they're going to be doing, where they're going to be focusing. A way, one way to do that is with Carlin's Fallon's pair comparison. It's not a bad way to do things, pair comparison. You have to be very careful how you have a conversation. You never use the word trade-off. Ever, ever, ever. It's taboo. You can't use the word trade-off. Okay, so then you're able to validate that you would rather, for where the project is, focus on capex and availability and expandability than opex and project schedule get a zero. <coughs> All that means is it's in really good shape right now. It doesn't mean it's not important, it just means compared to the others it's in really good shape. And we'll come back to this later. 
this is a, a dashboard for selecting value, improving practices, you move the sliders and stuff, it works pretty good. If you want a copy of it, drop me a line, I'll send it to you. Decision quality. Team alignment, this is one of the interesting ones. It's absolutely fascinating because it's not team consensus. It's not all this stuff you hear about everything has to be team consensus. You do this with individuals. So doing a, um, a decision, it's no better than a, a chain of links. It goes at least, uh, this comes out of Stanford again uh, from way back when. Is that a question? Uh, starting right over. I'm sorry, it's starting right over. Okay, we we'll fast. The big thing about doing this is we get all this stuff out, we run the team through it. We can see that the team are at different places with respect to going ahead. This is the average. What gets interesting is if you don't think we've got creative, doable alternatives, a whole bunch of people are down here below the average saying we don't, and quite a few people are ready to go ahead. They need to start talking to each other. Okay? This unfolds that. If we don't have good information, there's a spectrum here. Uh, similarly, with the commitment to action, there's a spectrum, so it's very useful to get that stuff. Then you look at the decision sets. We'll go by that. Decision classification. When we're looking at that, you're looking at what's already decided. You don't have to roll around it. Okay, we're going to develop this reservoir, we're not going over there. We're going to build in this country, we're not going to a different country. We're going to put electrons into the grid, we're not going to put molecules into it. We've made those decisions, don't rework them. Tactical, I don't care what jets you put in the bit. We don't have to do that right now. I'm not that worried about who you order the valve solenoids from. I don't care about that right now. I want you to work on where we are, the tactical stuff, the team focus. So don't worry about this stuff, and this is for later. Help me with this stuff right now. You're going to look at what are the decisions we can make. And you want those, those decisions to be mutually exclusive, hard to change, encompass the options, and really worth analyzing, worth analyzing and spending time on analyzing. Okay? When you do that, there doesn't tend to be that many big decisions. There's just not that many. I'll move straight on to the themes. So if you've got decisions, how wide is the JV team, uh, the value chain, the structure, the capacity? What are we doing for moving bulk and where are we marketing? The big thing about this is that you can link those together by saying, are you going to be cautious? Are you going to be the big dog? Are you going to be a major player or it's an aggressive early entry? And you take different decisions based upon that overall strategy. One of the things that you get out of this that's really useful is here we've got uh, capture the infrastructure, the absolutely lowest cost, the greenest solution, the earliest oil, and so on. So in each one of those overall strategies, and of course those are listed and they're described and so on. This is one of the decisions. Now when you start putting all of them in there, if you've got a decision here that never gets selected, you can say to management, let's not bother looking at that anymore. It doesn't matter what the strategy is, we never pick that one. And on the other hand, if you've got lines that always go through the same one here, we're always going to do a multiple number of wells instead of single completions. Let's just not bother. Everybody agrees, no matter what your strategy is. So you can test that to cut down the, the, the work you do. Okay. Influence diagramming, we can go quickly on. Influence diagramming is where you're looking at bubbles and what is influencing the return on investment. A couple of the, the, the software programs you can get will take things like this rich register. You can convert them into influence diagrams. This is all one called DPL. You've got capacity, operating rates, production volumes. You end up with revenues, expenses, and capital going into return on investment. All of these is on, are uncertain. You can put in what the probabilities are, play with it. The software in the background is building a tree and using Bayesian analysis to do the calculations. Similarly here. And you. Okay. This one's kind of important. Again, this, this came out of the function analysis and value engineering. Project planning and mapping. We used to do something like this. They called it the interactive project management 
uh, planning technique. We used to do it with a big wall, and now they're using software. I kind of push back against the software because you can't see very much on the screen at once. Similarly, when we do a lot of workshops, we've tried using Excel, and we've tried using our own software, but in many cases, using a big sheet or a big whiteboard that everybody can see works better, because you can see more of the thing in the building here. Yeah. So the planning map, functional analysis diagramming, is where you're asking how and why as you're working through stuff. This is not the plan. Is that is it my stuff or is it out of focus just a little bit? Maybe. I don't know. However, you're ah, there we go. Maybe maybe it's okay. So you're submitting a decision support package. How are you going to do that? You're going to do this, this, and this. How are you going to do that by doing this, this, and this? Why testing it this way? These are milestones. What you do is you test what has to happen in the project without talking about how it's actually done, whether it's farmed out to contractors, or whether at what level it's done, or who does it, or any of that stuff, or time. You do that first. Then, here we've got, how are you going to fund the final FEL3? We're going to review with management, how are we going to do that? We're going to prepare, we're going to review, we're going to prepare the DSP, we're going to select the development contract. When we do that, we finalize the basis of design, and we conduct phasers. How are you going to select? You're going to run the economics. How are you going to put it on the economics to populate the model? You can't populate the model unless you start building it today. You can't wait till the night before. So when you start doing that stuff, if you have a list of people, or if you don't know the actual people's names, you know the seats, the chairs that they'll be in, you can start populating the numbers in here of who's going to do what. So you've got numbers here, you can start moving the numbers over here, and you can start saying who's going to be responsible for getting it done, who's going to support it, actually do the work, and who's going to approve or set the criteria. If I ask how in this, this way, or ask why in this way, these are the answers I get, and then I can start marking schedule risk and uh, economic risk. Once you've got this thing built, and you start thinking of what are the actual times, then you can switch the time, then you can populate project of V6 with it, you can get a resource loading schedule, you know how much the people cost. When you've built that resource loading schedule with a multidisciplinary team, instead of having the guys have their eyes roll back in their heads when they see a printout from V6, because they've built the input for it. So here you've got an overall uh, organization map, you've got all the people listed, they're all identified, you've got some strategies that they're going to test, and this is the ongoing project management stuff that has to happen no matter what. Okay, so we're into that, we're into the second last one, we're into the business value, we're going to go through this quickly. This is a different methodology for engaging, some of you recognize this. It's very good to be able to say, if I can deliver you a graph of cumulative probabilities of net rent value expected, would that allow you to make a decision? Yes. Okay, let's start. So you start doing this stuff, take it away from the team, because you're not going to get it right, right away. Look at what's the client's return on investment spreadsheets. Take the risk analysis, get it into a better team, go back to the team, start building the actual models, then come back and get the models put properly evaluated, and then produce the cumulative net worth value and tell them where the job and so on are out the curves that they ask for, which will give them insights. What you'll find is that when you run tornado diagrams, there's just a few things that really make a big difference. Some of them don't matter that much. So here you've got the top three or four or five that really matter. Some of the rest aren't going to matter that much. This is never true. None of this stuff is going to be standard deviation. It's just not going to happen. Expected cost, given the probability of rate of return, that's not going to happen either. Anytime you see this P50 standard deviation, somebody's going to smoke. It's going to be much more like this. But what you're looking for is these are some curves of expected value, cumulative probabilities. This one looks interesting because it's probably going to have the higher expected value, but 
there's somewhere around about a 25% chance that things could really go south. And a risk averse company may not take that. But what they might say is, I like this. Is there anything we can do about these risks that can help us modify that? So that's kind of what we're looking at with respect to my phone call. Okay, so this was, this was a, another way of looking at things. One of the good things that I like about this particular approach is very often you don't have more than 60 or 70 endpoints. You can print it on a poster and you can have the conversation with management. It's not a black box. It's not putting some things into a software and coming out with, here's the answer from the software. They can play with the probabilities and endpoints. This is what you've got to be careful of. You go on our site, there's plenty of downloads that completely explains this concept entirely. It's under decision notes. Uh, this is the DNRE methodology I showed you a couple of uh, moments ago. The big thing about it, when you're going to do this stuff, it's going to be in the budget. If you don't have it in the budget, the project manager's not going to do it. It's not going to happen because it takes work. If you don't know how to do it internally, you're going to have to hire somebody. You're going to have to put teams out there. You're going to have to pay the EPC contractor to have staff there to have the conversations. It's not in the budget. It's not going to happen. Okay. Value improving practices. Whole new section on value improving practices. CII supports them. The Construction Industry Institute. IPA does. At this point, the cameras stopped working during our seminar. So we'll finish the presentation with a voiceover slideshow. Value improving practices, or VIPs as they are known, are rigorous scalable methodologies by which an owner can discover and implement financial project management and other improvement opportunities in capital projects. VIPs are very effective during early project activities, front end loading or FEL. To improve the project definition such that scope changes are minimized after project funding or sanction. Again, we have placed value improving practices, or VIPs as they are known, at the latter end of our blue sheet methodology. However, many of our clients call for standalone implementation of these powerful techniques. We should note VIPs may be applicable through all of FEL 1, 2, and 3, project execution, operations, and demolition or abandonment. A key attribute associated with VIP implementation is that the practices can be applied in a systematic approach with a methodology that allows repeatable and consistent results from project to project. Value improving practices are formal, intentional activities to improve project outcomes, such as cost, operability, schedule, reliability, etc., and that can be measured. These are separate formal activities, not simply part of the normal project development process. Generally, industry recognizes 12 VIPs. Each VIP provides a unique forum that challenges the project scope and discovers alternative value opportunities. VIPs are very effective during early project activities, front end loading or FEL 1 and 2. To improve the project definition, such that scope changes are again minimized after project sanction into the phase. Industry experience shows that projects with better defined scopes at authorization yield better total value and are more efficient to execute than poorly defined projects. Superior FEL and VIP implementation results in less recycle, fewer delays and reduced project team costs. Selecting VIPs for application using the selection dashboard requires first consideration of three factors. First, we must know our objectives for applying value practices. Secondly, the value practice should have a good chance of 
adding more value than just the cost of application. And thirdly, we must consider the need to limit chase costs during project development. The key objective is to establish clear guiding principles that are aligned to the business strategy and drivers, enabling selection of the appropriate VIPs to implement on each particular project. Effective application of VIPs is proven to yield improved project outcomes that can be directly measured and to achieve a significantly positive impact on full cycle return on our investment. While VIPs are listed separately with different targeted areas of focus for project improvement, it is possible to conduct several of the VIPs in an integrated fashion during a single VIP study or engagement workshop. With proper planning and customized follow-up, the VIPs shown here in red can be conducted in a single intense team engagement over several days. The basis for conducting integrated VIPs requires clarity of project priorities, assemblage of several project design, cost and construction documents, and an in-depth function analysis of PFDs, process flow diagrams, prior to bringing the full project team together to conduct the work. However, it's not unusual to be able to have a 10 to 15 percent impact on capital expense and an improvement in return on investment also. Here we see the methodology for conducting integrated multiple VIPs together. Conducting integrated VIPs needs clear pro project priorities and putting together the project design cost and construction documents prior to bringing the full project team together to conduct the work. We need to do the setting business priorities and address custom standards and specifications. And then with the analysis of technical and operational function analysis, we can conduct, for example, technology selection, design to capacity, waste minimization, and value engineering all at the same time. We can then uh, continue into constructability. This slide shows various individual and discrete targets for improvement of the VIP selected for the integrated approach in our example. Uh, you may wish to freeze this slide to note the different areas of focus for each VIP. A repeatable VIP process, such as shown here, with pre-event and function analysis normally conducted prior to the workshop engagements. Following the classic value methodology through creativity, ranking, analysis and option development, and finally, further work packages to deliver the improvements. There are, of course, software packages available to enhance these VIP implementation initiatives and conduct them. So in summary, when applied effectively, value improving practices will return improved project outcomes and overall return on investment. A key attribute associated with these descriptions is the practices be applied in a systematic approach with a methodology that allows them to be repeatable and consistent from project to project when they are applied. Decision Support Package. Decision Support Package, or DSP, DSP, is a compilation of key project information used to support decision making at each FEL gate. The FEL methodology stipulates that the project should not progress through the gate to the next stage until the project team presents the gatekeeper with the key to the gate, the completed Decision Support Package. 
Goals of presenting the DSP are to present the current status of the project and the current challenges and opportunities to the gatekeeper, to document the work performed in the FEL process to date aligned with the work that should be performed, addressing new or reaffirming expected opportunities with respect to opportunity risk, uncertainty and technologies, present the rational for the plan and resources required for the next funded phase, and an opportunity for feedback from the decision makers to the project team and discussion of any changes in strategy or direction for the following FEL stages. The executive summary of the DSP is a standalone document that provides an overview of the project. The executive summary may range for small projects to just one page to 10 or more pages, depending on the size of the project. The executive summary includes a uh, project overview, including a statement of requirements, the business case, including the financial memorandum to be approved, decision and risk analysis to the requisite level the gatekeeper needs to be able to make the decision, and the rationale and plan for the project and the next steps, including resource allocation for the next FEL phase. Using information provided in the DSP, the gatekeeper will then either approve the project, giving the team the ability to pass through the gate to the next stage and the funding for it, defer the project based on portfolio management perhaps, kill the project as a result of the team's recommendation that the project is no longer viable, or choose to recycle the project for further work. DSP requirements generally change somewhat in both focus and rigor as projects and investments move through the FEL stages. In engaging project management, rigorous FEL efforts that include VIPs provide better project definition, improve business value options and deliver better project controls. Industry experience shows that projects with better defined scopes at authorization yield better total value and are more efficient with respect to cost schedule and resources. For more than three decades now, many major projects and portfolios of small works projects have been implementing this value and value improving practices as a part of good front end loading. In conclusion, there are well proven overall methods and proven tool sets and approaches available for project teams to improve their projects and return on project delivery. And we believe even in down markets, strong project teams can deliver an improvement in project capex and return on investment. That all business opportunities and project portfolios benefit from a proven and effective front end loading process. Operating teams with coaching and analysis can significantly improve operating expense and production ex efficiency. And ethical consultants and coaches goal should be to ensure client teams are self-sufficient in the methods as soon as possible. To assure teams are focused and aligned with management expectations through the FEL process, there are practical methods available to enhance the discussion. These augment industry standard FEL processes and improve the content of DSP. Rather than selecting various tool sets from many different approaches, development of an overall alignment and integration of project optimization, decision and risk analysis, planning and value management process has been crafted and proven over the last two decades with major projects and portfolios worldwide. Uh, project teams can unfold the spectrum of potential outcomes for decision makers with rational proven methods. Graphical uh, presentation of the range of expected value outcomes and the inherent probability of challenge to return on investment can clarify 
decision options for gatekeepers. Using innovative organization mapping techniques builds credible resource planning to provide assurance to management of validity of project resource planning to progress through the FEL process. With capability of multiple coaching techniques and supporting software and data management options, experienced project teams can learn to apply these techniques quite speedily. Project teams can assure alignment with management strategy and decision-making imperatives early in the project process and significantly reduce uh, rework and non-productive work. Today's data management and computational capabilities have freed teams to test and analyze decision options and a spectra of potential outcomes to provide rigorous advice to management and in DSPs prepared for gatekeepers. For any information on the subject matter we covered and on other project management optimization methods, please visit and review Pinnacle Results website at pinnacleresults.com. We're always happy to share. Feel free to contact us and ask how we can help or share information with you.